podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to Welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. What's up, everybody? Hope you're ready to get edumacated. This is Smart People Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Chris Stemp. And I'm John Rojas. And this is episode 101. So we're now cruising on. We're in triple digits. Apparently, recently, people have been finding the show. We've been getting a lot of emails. The numbers have been going up. It's so much fun. It's a blast. And I'm almost done saying at the beginning of the show, oh my gosh, we have a great guest because they have now, they're just all trickling in to be awesome guests. Like this guy literally wrote the book, wrote the book on startups. He did. He wrote the startup owner's manual. He That's wrote the manual the on how to be a startup. And when we say manual, it's thick. I mean, he even says in the book, you know what? Don't try and sludge through all this at once. This is somewhere you go when you're serious about being an entrepreneur and you need that template. You need that guiding light. So we're, we're talking this week to Steve Blank. Steve Blank is recognized for developing the customer development methodology, which launched the lean startup movement. A lot of people have heard of kind of lean startups and all that, but they don't realize Steve's the guy that that started it. He has over 30 years within the high tech industry. He founded and worked with eight startup companies, four of which have gone public. One that he sold for like $300 million and he started it from his living room. He's a professor of entrepreneurship at Stanford. He currently lectures at the Haas School of Business at Berkeley, Columbia, Caltech. (laughs) The guy knows his stuff. So we're really pumped to talk to Steve today. We're both entrepreneurial minded. We like that kind of creativity. We want to figure out how to start our own company. That's how the podcast evolved. I know a lot of you out there are entrepreneurial as well. So this is going to be a great episode for you guys. I'm going to ask a huge favor of you guys. Please head over to iTunes, leave a rating, a comment. Actually, definitely leave a comment because it forces you to leave a rating and it helps us move up the charts. So make sure that you're leaving a review there for us. Before we get to the show, we want to tell you a little bit about this week's awesome sponsor. Look what I brought you. Man, I really hope there's nothing breakable in there. John just gave me the box of awesome that was sent to us by our most recent sponsor, Bespoke Post. They're really awesome. They send you a box at the beginning of the month of dude stuff. And you can go check them out at bespokepost.com slash smart. That's B-E-S-P-O-K-E-P-O-S-T dot com slash smart. Make sure you use that link. It helps let them know that you heard about them on our show. What we're going to do is we're going to open the box of awesome on the show and let you guys know the cool stuff that comes inside gets delivered to your door. It feels like Christmas. It really does. I, Are I, you ready for this? I never understood this concept until I got it. I, I was like, this is oh, amazing. Yeah. Let's do this. All right. Open it up, John. Let's cut this open. What do we got? This is amazing. <laughs> it's, so, there's so much stuff in here. I don't even know what to do. So I'm taking out the first couple drink glasses. Oh, this is an alcohol set. This is definitely an alcohol set. So I'm glad I dropped it on the desk in front of you. Oh, this is one of those is... bar bartender oh, shaker a, things. A shaker. Nice. It's an ice ball mold for drinks, and it makes 55 millimeter ice balls, So they, which fit. is the perfect thing for drinking neat drinks. Oh, awesome. And I do love my bourbon. If you guys want to send bourbon our way. It's pretty cool. A thing to squeeze limes. Oh, sweetness. Into the drinks. It's basically a full bar set and like stainless steel, nice glass. And so this is just one example of, you know, the mo- this month you'd get it and you'd be on your way to making amazing cocktails. So if you guys want this kind of special stuff every month, it's only 45 bucks and the retail cost of the items is always higher than the Far 45. Exceeds it. So you're getting a deal every month, plus you get to open something up. Something to look forward to because we need that every once in a while. So make sure you visit bespokepost.com slash smart to save 20% off your first box. I mean, give it a shot for the first month. I, dude, these glasses are awesome. I'm going to go pour this a is bourbon. Amazing. Let's go get a I'm drink. I'm going to pour a bourbon. So remember, helping out our sponsors helps us out, helps support the show. 
And check us out at smartpeoplepodcast.com. That's where we keep our world. Got all types of good stuff there. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, connect, enjoy, keep going, carry on, go strong. Don't put all your chickens in a basket. Are you done yet? (laughs) Enjoy the interview with Steve Blank. Of the Four Steps to the Epiphany, which is now out in hardcover with uh, 10,000 more commas and 3,000 typos fixed. <laughs> was it really that much? It was, well, it was my class notes. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't until Eric Reese, uh, the master of many good pieces of advice, said, Why are you making Xeroxes? That's out of the 19th century. Why don't you do, at least put your class notes on Cafe Press and have them printed for you and have the students buy it? Huh. And that was called The Four Steps of the Epiphany. I slapped a cover on it, which you could tell it was a slapped on cover. <laughs> and um, uh, it, again, they were just my musings on what I thought was wrong with entrepreneurship and ended up uh, starting a revolution no, um, and, by accident. And it really is. It's amazing stuff. Have we read it? Well, that's the thing. So your publisher actually sent us the Startup Owner's Manual about two weeks ago and then sent us the four steps to the epiphany just a couple days ago. And I work for an extremely small startup. We have about five full-time employees and I love it. I I love, I mean, it just provides kind of a backbone for me to look at and and not feel so out of place when things are going wrong and and stuff's going crazy. You know, the four steps to the epiphany was actually, uh, if you remember the scene in the matrix, uh, the blue pill or the red pill. (laughs) 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 And and we've all kind of unfortunately decided to take one of Steve's pills, but you (laughs) see the world completely differently after you start thinking about it. And, uh, you know, I find it amusing now that it's common wisdom. And my wife and I just laugh hysterically because it was so hard to think about this huh. when no one else, I mean, it was like every idea was, well, how come no one else is talking about it? Maybe we're just so wrong. Could it be that everybody else was like wrong for 40 years? And the answer was, F- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it's amazing. I mean, I- it was, and, and actually what inspired me were a couple of things. You know, uh, when I retired, uh, I thought what the world really needed was my memoirs of, you know, 20 years in, in the trenches. And, and in hindsight, it was actually good to do because it was a catharsis. It was a release. But I actually started writing war stories about every company I'd been in and some of the tricks I had done as a marketeer and what I learned as a successful CEO and a failed CEO and vice versa. And I would summarize all of them with, you know, something called the lessons learned. And at the about 80 pages in it, I remember the moment the hair stood up on the back of my neck and said, oh, my God, there's a pattern here I had never seen before. And by this time, I was sitting on boards of public companies and advisory boards and investing. I hadn't seen as much as a as a traditional venture capitalist. But for an entrepreneur, it was a pretty good run. And I realized that either I was smoking something or. <laughs> there was a pattern that no one had ever noticed. And I had just read a book by a sociologist in the mid-20th century named Joseph Campbell, who had written a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Have have you ever heard of this book? You know what? It's so funny you mention it. I actually auditioned to speak at a TEDx out here, and John and I went, and the theme of the TEDx was a hero's journey, and it was all about Joseph Campbell. All right, and so for your listeners who don't know Campbell... He was a guy who happened to read a bunch of mythology, Greek mythology and Chinese mythology and, you know, modern uh, stories and st- stories from the Bible. And he realized that the myth about a hero, regardless of the culture, was actually the same story. And then the, the story went like this. The hero is uh, called by some higher power. The hero ignores the calling. And then some stra- tragedy happens where the hero accepts the calling and the hero goes on the on the quest for something with a band of compatriots and they go through physical and emotional and spiritual trials and and near the end just about their when they reach their goal they go through a physical or or spiritual death and rebirth and then they're changed and they reach the goal and of course that's the story of Moses Jesus and Luke Skywalker. Um, <laughs> and in fact, George Lucas will tell you he read Joseph Campbell and actually used that as the basis of Star Wars. And in fact, it's become su- such a uh, almost a joke in Hollywood is that you, for the 30 years, wrote screenplays to do the hero's journey. But what, what struck me is no one had noticed that the same theme was true for the entrepreneur's journey. Because every one of us, myself included, 
believed that it was a solitary journey, that every startup was the same, that there were no repeatable patterns, that if you got any wisdom at all, it was because your venture capitalist made you execute some you know, income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow for some five-year plan, and you were a fool if you didn't you know, pristinely execute the plan, not understanding that every startup CEO was failing in almost identical ways and going through the same pattern of failure and redemption and cycles and travails, but we never understood that pattern. And I decided to write about it, and that was the four steps to the epiphany. And um, then Eric Reese took my class at Berkeley and made a major contribution of, of putting together my insight about customer development with his insight about engineering and agile development. And then later on, Alexander Osterwalder's uh, business model uh, uh, generation book with the business model canvas put together the last piece of what was missing for what became the Lean Startup. And so it's been one heck of a journey, and I think we've made entrepreneurship better for it. I definitely agree after reading the book. Now, could you let us in on your discoveries and tell us some of these standard problems that most startups go through? Yeah, but I'll give you the, the, just one of many examples. And, and, uh, and I laugh about this now in hindsight because some startups are, and some dumb VCs are still doing it. But the classic is, in the old days, you used to think about your product. I have an idea. You go out and raise money from VCs who, or you know, angels who say, oh, that is a great idea. And then your engineering group goes into waterfall development. That is, uh, they kind of implicitly assume they understand the customer problem, so also implicitly assume they understand all the features to build, and therefore lock up engineers for months or even in the old days, years or two, if you were building hardware, and go through a phase of you know design, you know alpha test, beta test, first customer ship, and you'd hire a sales force and a marketing department, and the big day would be first customer ship and launch, and you'd have a launch party. And the, you were fairly competent. You got great press, whether print or blogs nowadays or something else. And in the first board meeting, after the announcement, the board would high-five the VP of marketing. Great. Wonderful. Six weeks later, you have another board meeting, and they now turn to the VP of sales. And because you actually had sold the investors this five-year plan, which they invested in, seeing the revenue having this nice linear curve after, after launch, they turn to the VP of sales and go, how's it look? And the VP of sales would always say, great pipeline. Now, <laughs> now you're laughing. Your listeners might not know is that, that actually means sales suck, but it might get, you know, be good someday. So I'm just going to tell you there's lots of stuff going on, but no real money has hit the bank. And, and it's okay. It's only the you know, second board meeting after the launch. And th this repeats itself every six weeks. That tends to be the cycle that you have on a, a venture-backed uh, uh, board. And, uh, you know, depending on the economic climate, the VP of sales would keep saying pipeline, pipeline, and some revenue would trickle in, but it wouldn't match the plan until one day you open the board meeting and no one is sitting next to the VP of sales. Mm -hmm. In fact, the stench of death is in the room. And you have no idea how they did it, but there's a flaming sword over his head. <laughs> <laughs> and the minute he says pipeline, there's a puff of smoke and there are just ashes left on the floor and a new VP of sales is sitting there. Now, this sounds funny, but the new VP of sales would look around look at the old VP's uh, sales strategy and go, well, that was stupid. Oh, obviously, they were getting the customers wrong. We're going to call on a different customer segment. Or if they were a little more creative, they'd blame it all on engineering and saying, oh, it's the wrong feature set. And by the way, this would continue another six months or a year with your new VP of sales until numbers were still weren't looking good. So the next person you'd fire was the VP of marketing. Must be a positioning problem. And then, again, if the company still has money left, you eventually fire the founding CEO and bring in some expert. Now, I'm telling you this long, shaggy dog story because we did this for 40 years, never once realizing that every time we fired an executive, we were pivoting. It's a big idea. The only way we change strategy in the past is by firing people. We assumed the plan was correct, and therefore it must be a people problem. The big insight now is, no, 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 no. Startups aren't smaller versions of large companies. It's large companies that execute plans because you could put together a plan with a series of unknowns. But startups don't have any knowns. The startups have a series of unknowns. What startups are doing are searching. Large companies are executing. So therefore, when, when you run into a problem, the odds are your hypotheses about customers or features or channel or pricing were wrong. Not that the person was wrong. They might be, 
But the odds are your, your fundamental assumptions were wrong. So why don't we have a process where we could actually fail rapidly and quickly and make those changes? And that's what's called the pivot, a substantive change to one or more of the business model canvas components. Does that long story make sense? It actually makes perfect sense. Well, now I'm scared. The only reason is because I've heard of this. Obviously, I've read your book, and I definitely understand it having worked for a couple of small companies. The one thing I still find difficult is how do you recommend startups test their hypotheses? Well, it's kind of funny. You know, this whole wing startup thing is composed of three simple pieces. So let me start there and then I'll answer your question. Can I? Sure. So, you know, the first thing starts with something called the business model, which is a used to be a nice academic word, which took you about a semester to describe and 600 pages to figure out until Osterwalder came around. And his book, Business Model Generation, basically says, look, I could show it to you in one picture, has nine boxes in it and actually does a pretty darn good job for startups in figuring out all the things you need to worry about. Who are the customers? What's the pricing? What's the channel? You know, uh, uh, who are partners? What are costs, et cetera? And we call this the business model canvas. We tend to use this because our definition of a startup is as follows. A startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. What that means is First of all, I throw in temporary organizations because a lot of startups think the goal of a startup is to stay a startup because it's a lot of fun. <laughs> the goal of a startup is actually to become a large company. There's no such thing as a 10-year-old startup. There's a <laughs> two-year-old startup attached to an eight-year-old failure that you just didn't get the memo for. And, and the second part is designed to search. You're actually looking for stuff. You're not executing. And if you're an engineer, that's really hard because what you think you should do is write more code or more features or whatever. And you're looking for something that repeats and that could scale. And so what your job is, is to take this business model, which is nothing more than a series of hypotheses about each part of your business. And if you break it down, the word hypotheses I use at Stanford because they pay $50,000 a year. <laughs> Outside of Stanford, they're called guesses. Um, and so if you really think about it, on day one, even if you're a domain expert, that is, you're, you're an expert in one part of the business, you're likely guessing about the rest of your business. You're kind of guessing about pricing. I mean, you have a feeling, but, you know, there's no facts inside your building. And so I have a phrase that says, there's no facts in your building, so get the heck outside. And that's because, as smart as you are, we now know there's no way you're smarter than the collective intelligence of your potential customers. And so the process of getting outside the building is the part I invented called customer development. It's a kind of a, a fairly rigorous process that says, let's go out and test each one of those guesses, each one of those hypotheses about who our customers are, about what features they want. And by the way, that match between what you're building and who the customers are are two of the most important things you test first. And it even has its own special name. Those two things you test first customers and features are called product market fit, right? And so when people say, do you have product market fit? What they're really saying is, are you building anything that people have raised their hand for or, or even better grabbed you by the collar and said, I'll take the demo or I'll even take the slides. And if you don't get that, then, you know, adding more features probably isn't the answer. And then the third piece is the way we do this is with something called agile engineering. If you remember my description earlier, we would in the past, try to build the, the entire product on day one and then only find out later after we ship is that people didn't want 90% of what we built. Now we use a process called uh, agile engineering. Well, we'll build the product incrementally and iteratively, making small tests of whether this is something that people want or, or are we on the right track and might not even be a smaller version of the company, might be just kind of a cheap hack to see if um, people would pay for the output of something. And so these three pieces, business model canvas, customer development, and agile engineering make up the lean startup. And how you get out of the building first, by the way, when I first used to say get out of the building to my students, I'd find them milling around the parking lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I said, no, 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 go call on customers. And the next thing I knew is they were like demoing, you know, slideware saying, well, would you buy it? And I said, no, you can't use slides. And so then they, you know, if it was an iPhone app, they'd run out and say, Oh, can we demo it to you? And that's not customer development either. What you really want to understand first, which is really kind of hard, is I understand you, the founder, believe you're solving a problem. 
just tell me that you found 10 or 20 other people who believe that that problem you think is important, they think is important. Does that make sense for step one? Yes. Sorry for the long soliloquy. How do you go about doing that though? Because I, I work in the consulting industry, so I'm so used to demos and slides and all that kind of stuff. How do you go out to those customers without showing the demo? I mean, what are the questions that you're asking? Can you walk me through that? Sure. So uh, tell me what kind of consulting you guys do. I do federal consulting. So it's basically project management type consulting, financial management, those Great. type of things. So, so some, somewhere back in the dim past of your company, there was a founder who actually went out and, and maybe in the old days tried to sell his services. Right. And it was kind of long and hard and maybe you got, you know, some business, et cetera, that way. But if I was starting a consulting business this way, I would actually just get a list of names out of, you know, the best ones are introductions for friends or go through your LinkedIn or Facebook or Jigsaw. And, and the way I'd sometimes get meetings is I'd call or email people and say, hi, I got your name from X. They said you were the smartest person in this business. Hmm. Whoa. Now, by the way, if somebody ever told you that, are you going to hang up on them? And the next thing is kind of the killer. Then you say, listen, I'm not trying to sell you anything. Oh, then they exhale. And then you say, look, I'm just trying to start this company, but I don't even know if I'm solving the right problem. Can I have 20 minutes of your time? So imagine you call someone up and then you've got a meeting with them. And actually, the way you do customer development, it's not surveys. The goal, at least in the initial part of customer development and the discovery part, is you need to see people's pupils dilate. And the reason is... You're actually monitoring their body language, heart rate, skin color, et cetera, to see if, like, are they blowing smoke or not? I mean, people like to, if they at least will have a meeting with you, are going to try to be nice, and that's the worst thing that can happen to you. What you really are trying to understand is, is this something that's exciting to them? But the first conversation is, look, I'm trying to solve a problem, you know, in your X industry. Explain to me, you know, if, what kind of problems you have not problems I want to solve, what are your top five problems? And then they might go through the list, and you might actually be lucky that yours is in the top five. Most of the time, you'll not hear your problem. Sure. And you'll go, well, what are the next 10 problems? <laughs> you know, most of the time, it's not even there until they get to number 34. And you go, whoa, well, which problems do you pay to solve? Numbers one and two. Well, that's pretty good data. Then you could probably ask as well, what about number 34? Or you could go home and say, huh, that's interesting. Let's go call on 20 more people. And you might decide we could solve problem two if we just reconfigure the product. But let's assume your, your problem is actually on the top of their list. The next thing you ask is about how did they solve it today? Hey, listen, you said that was the second most important problem for your company. How are you solving it today? And you could get a series of answers, again, for a consultant, is, oh, we don't solve it at all. It's so painful, but we, you know, we'd pay anything to solve. Boy, in, in the times of my life, I heard <laughs> we'd pay anything to solve. It was a public offering four years later. Wow. But sometimes you hear, oh, we've jury rigged, a piece, you know, the, we buy a piece from here and a piece from there, and we hire these people. And then the third level is if they say that, you go, well, what if you could solve the problem with an easy-to-use X or Y or a single vendor or whatever? And sometimes they'd say, boy, if you could do that, that's really exciting. Now, by the way, notice you've never pulled out a PowerPoint. You never told them about your product. You never sold anything. You're actually shutting up and listening, and people love to talk. Does that make sense so far? It makes perfect sense. Right? And, and this is really counterintuitive to founders because you're so driven by your passion, you need to share it with the world. And by the way, I understand that. The most, the most difficult part of this whole customer development process is not that it requires any math. It's just counterintuitive to the, to the vision and passion that drives founders. I was just going through in my head the, the company I work for and how I can kind of transition this into that, into my next meeting without saying, Hey, uh, let's pause what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I, I warn all potential acolytes, for God's sake, if, your if this isn't your boss's vision, don't try this at home or you'll be an ex-employee. Um, exactly. And, and two is, is that people who do become converts tend to want to sell the religion. What you need to sell is the results of actually practicing the religion. That is, hey, you know, I know we're building X, but... 
you know, the last 45 people I've talked to in the last, you know, three and a half weeks said they'd really pay for why. Well, who cares about why you did that and how you did that and they're getting out of the bed? No one cares. You now have some facts. Now, now that now that's an interesting conversation. Rather than arguing inside of meetings about, you know, who has the biggest personal appendage, you can now <laughs> be arguing about like, well, that's funny. That's your opinion. Let me tell you what customers who want to write us a check want. Unless you're the founder, and then the founder can say, we're all adopting this religion. Is that difficult for a founder to justify veering off of his original course? Because then the product or service may no longer be what he set out to create. So if you're a world-class founder, you have such a great reality distortion field is you tend to warp the past. <laughs> you, you will always believe hmm. that what you're doing now <laughs> is what you were absolutely certainly planning on doing on day one. It's amazing. It's an amazing characteristic of great founders is they tend to kind of integrate this stuff and slowly move themselves into the future. It's, it's what happens. No, that makes and sense. It's yeah. a little disconcerting for the other employees who don't see that shift, but great founders do this. The, the corollary to this, though, the bad uh, part of being able to pivot is that nowadays pivot has also become an excuse for attention deficit disorder. Uh, mm -hmm. Meaning, I've heard this good idea from one customer, so I run back to my company and jerk uh, you know, product development around once every 72 hours. So that's also given rise to kind of that symptom, which I call, you know, pivot attention deficit disorder. You, you can't be pivoting every 72 hours. You got to kind of like let this stuff process for a while. But great founders will actually look for bigger opportunities and do that kind of pattern recognition in their head in, in real time and go, wait a minute, I've now heard this 14 other times. And people have been trying to throw money at me. I'll give you an example. You know, I have a line that says, accountants don't run startups. So, by the way, it's true, uh, with apologies to the two accountants out there who actually might be running them. But if you really look at it, it's the most underrepresented job title in, in who, who becomes founders. I had a set of students, a great team. They were building a, uh, an iPhone app, and they were testing pricing. And they came back and said, Professor Blank, we got it nailed. You know, we talked to 50 people, and look at this data, 94%, 47 out of 50, said 9.99 is the right price. Gee, I didn't need a survey for that, but thank you, okay. And I said, really? Let me see the spreadsheet. And I looked at the spreadsheet and thought, oh, my God. I said, have you guys looked at the other three people? Oh, yeah, th those were real outliers. We just tossed out that data. I said, why don't you stand up in front of the class and read what those three people from different industries told you that they would want? Oh, that's silly. We can't. No, stand up in front of the class. And they said, well, the three people all said that instead of paying $9.99, they'd pay $25,000 if we had these two more features. What? I said, so help me understand. Why did you not like do that? They said, oh, Professor Plank. 47 customers is bigger than three. <laughs> <laughs> and so I remind people that when you're getting out of the building and you're collecting data, this isn't an F and focus group. Hmm. What you're looking for is insight, not just data. The insight said, and the reason, the real reason they discarded those three is, oh, it would have taken us three and a half months to add those two features. Well, in the big scheme of things, they could have been possibly, I don't know if it was a good idea, but they could have been an enterprise software company selling you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of software, if they like would have stepped back and said, gee, do those three people have any more friends? That's pretty consistent data. Maybe we ought to be seeing whether there were more people there. But instead, they discarded that path because they had already made up their minds. They wanted to be an iPhone app. Does that make sense? It does. It does. What characteristics have you discovered are typical of most good founders? You know, um, one of the things that uh, I used to get wrong is kind of getting wrong the distinction between who's a founder, who's on the founding team, and who's a founding CEO. And I think, um, you know, we've done a bad job in defining those two. So let me give it my shot. You know, this isn't perfect, but it, it will kind of help your, your listeners kind of sort this out. You know, a founder is the one with the original idea. Original idea could be, you know, in their dorm room or it could be a true scientific discovery or a technical breakthrough in a lab. And a founder typically is the one that recruits co-founders and then becomes a part of the founding team in day-to-day -day company operations. 
By the way, in some industries like biotech, that's not true. The founder might be a tenured professor who's not going to give up their faculty position so they could become the head of a startup's advisory board. Now, a couple of caveats with, about founders with ideas. One of the hardest concepts for my students to grasp is an idea is not a company. Let me say it again. <laughs> an idea, just because you had one, is not a company. In fact, without the company around it to commercialize it, the idea is worthless. And second, it's important to differentiate between ideas that have been patented and dorm room ideas. Hey, I thought of a great idea. Or worse, classroom contributions. I worked on the project with a team for 10 weeks, so I should be a founder. And even if they become part of the founding team, it's and here's the hard thing too, it's not a given that the founder, having come up with the idea or the vision, has a leadership role in the new company. Because that the next level is the founding team, which includes the founder, but a few other co-founders with complementary skills. This is the group who will build the company. And its goal is to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. Now, in web and mobile startups, the canonical view that Dave McClure says this all the time, the founding team consists of a hacker, a hustler, and a designer. In other fields, the skill sets differ, but the key idea is you want a team with complementary skills. And to answer your question, the key attributes of an entrepreneur on a founding team are passion, determination, resilience, tenacity, agility, and curiosity. It also helps if the team has a history of working together but what's essential is mutual respect, and what's critical is trust. You need to be able to trust your co-founders to perform, to do what they say, and whether they'll have your back. Now, one more thing, if I can. There's a special member of the founding team who's the founding team CEO, and they're the first among equals. Ironically, they're almost never the most intelligent person on the team. What sets them apart from the team is they have an additional skill set on top of the others I mentioned. These people can project a fearless reality distortion field that they use to recruit, fundraise, pivot, and position the company. They have the vision and the passion and skill to communicate why this seemingly crazy idea will work and change the world. Think of Steve Jobs or Larry Ellison or Bill Gates. So that's my long answer to a question I even forgot what you asked. <laughs> <laughs> no. We'll take it. No, it was great. And actually, I listened to another interview that you did, and you talked about how entrepreneurship is a calling, and it's more, yeah. a, it's more akin to being an artist. You bet. We got this wrong for, <laughs> since the beginning of entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley. You know, we used to teach, and we used to some places still do, entrepreneurship like it's accounting <laughs> or like it's a law. Meaning you could sit in the room and, you know, we'll teach you theory and you'll graduate with a certificate in entrepreneurship and you've written three business plans and 14 PowerPoints and read cases at Harvard and you're some effing genius like you know what the hell you're doing. Turns out entrepreneurship is a very experiential skill. It's passion and vision driven. And in fact, we've been using the wrong model for decades. The model of entrepreneurship is not those other careers I mentioned. The model of entrepreneurship education is actually teaching artists. More importantly, it's like teaching composers or sculptors or painters, people who see things that the rest of us don't. We could have been in a, in a field in France, you know, in the 1880s and seen some guy with a white canvas missing one ear. And the next day came back and sun came up and he just painted Starry Night. We'd just seen a blank canvas. Or being in a Florence in the Middle Ages and walking into Michelangelo's studio and seeing him staring at a 12-foot block of marble. And you come back three years later, and there's the most beautiful sculptor in the world, the Pieta. And you ask him how he did it. And the apocryphal quote is, I just removed the stone around it. Or, hmm. or you listen to Beethoven, who is deaf, but he heard the Fifth Symphony. You know, how the hell did he do that? We just saw a blank piece of paper. But, you know, he was able to put what was what in his head on a score. That's what world-class founders do. They see something that no one else does. And their goal is to remove all the obstacles in front of them to make that happen. And my contribution is, and we're going to allow them to kind of learn as they're heading for the goal, whether that's the exact right direction or not, but they are driven and everything is just something to remove out of the way. And that means it was also allowed me to answer the question, can you teach entrepreneurship? Because, you know, I had been a practitioner for 20 years and when I became an educator, my friends were hysterical. They're going, Steve... If there was anybody who was a born entrepreneur, it was you. How the, how the hell can you teach this? And that bothered me for about a decade. And then I realized we've been asking the wrong question for 50 years. Not whether you could teach entrepreneurship. It's like asking the question, could you teach art? 
But it's the same question. It's not whether you could teach it. It's who can you teach it to? And much like teaching art, you can't draft artists or entrepreneurs. You can't say for passion-driven fields, hey, you're an artist, sit in this class. You can't say you're an entrepreneurial founder, sit in this class. What you could do is only teach it to those who are desperate to learn. And when you find those people, you still don't know whether they're going to be Da Vinci or Michelangelo or saying how many coats do they want on the wall. You don't know. But you can teach them the basic skills that we now know make up the art of entrepreneurship. So those skills, the ones that you teach, would you consider that is the information that you put into your two books, the Startup Manual and the Four Steps to the Epiphany? Yes. And, and in fact, it's the stuff that you know I've come up with, Eric Reese has come up with, Osterwalder's come up with. What we're essentially doing is we're now developing a management stack for founders. If you think about it, the first business school in the United States for, for a graduate class, Harvard, 1908, for the last hundred years, we've been developing a cadre of managers to administer existing companies, masters of business administration. And we've developed a whole set of management tools and strategies and techniques and teaching ways to teach those people. But those people were people who executed. No one stepped back and said, wait a minute, what's the stuff that you're supposed to know in the first two years? Turns out that what we were doing was trying to shoehorn in all these execution tools and giving them to founders. And it turns out they're destructive in the first two years, not like useful. Everything you learned in business school is how to put your company out of business. <laughs> now, no, 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 it's, I'm not dissing business school because you will need those people when you have found a repeatable model. Those people are actually awesome and you want MBAs in your company to execute. But this explains why world-class people in large companies melt down in startups because, in fact, it appears to them completely chaotic with nothing that looks repeatable. And the answer is you're correct. You're looking for special people, and now we're giving them their own tools to think about how do you kind of bound this chaotic space with kind of – it's like teaching artists in the Renaissance 3D perspective or how to mix colors. It didn't – tell them how to make the Last Supper, but it gave them a set of tools that says, oh, you foreshorten here in the foreground, and here's what you do in the background, and whatever. And it allowed them to have some basic thoughts about, oh, this is how we do this kind of art. That's what we've now done in the last three to five years, and it's only going to get better. This truly is a renaissance for entrepreneurs. Your career has spanned across numerous industries. Do you think, <laughs> I mean, do you think that that has helped you yeah, or, oh yeah. or has it hurt you? <laughs> you know, attention deficit disorder has been great. I'm a poster child for that. Um, you know, I, I started as a college dropout, joined the military in the middle of the Vietnam War, got sent to Southeast Asia to fix fighter planes, you know, uh, worked in the Midwest in automobile factories when, when we actually knew how to make stuff at the peak of American manufacturing in the mid-70s, came out to Silicon Valley in 78, and ended up by accident, just by pure accident, in the middle of the most secret um, company working for the CIA, NSA, and National Reconnaissance Office. And then my boss ended up eventually as the Secretary of Defense, Bill Perry. Oh, wow. And then getting out of the spook world and joining a microprocessor startup and doing, you know, when Silicon Valley was Silicon, did two chip companies, did enterprise software, did video games, did, you know, consumer electronics did a variety of things, and most of them, uh, actually, unlike my students today, who somehow were born CEOs, I did the apprenticeship route, meaning I had more and more responsibility as I kind of learned and worked for, for others. I think it just gave me an, an incredibly broad view, and I tend to be curious. And my only skill was one that drives me is I tend to be curious, and the skill I have is pattern recognition. And I tend to correlate things from to separate places and seem to notice things that are out there. And half the time they're hallucinations, but every once in a while they're a vision. <laughs> and, the, you know, the lean startup stuff and the customer development stuff. And, you know, the other thing I've written is the, something called The Secret History of Silicon Valley, which you can find on YouTube, which is the untold story of how the valley really started, and that which just was more pattern recognition stuff. Now that you have been both in the startup world and in academia, 
Do you feel like our education system is preparing students to succeed as business owners and entrepreneurs? Well, that's a loaded question with that. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, my <and> base. Since, <laughs> since I teach there, I'm not going to go diss the schools. But, you know, one of the things I've learned, you know, when you have a, I have to tell you, having a type A entrepreneur hit Stanford, Berkeley, and Columbia has been a really interesting experience. And I got to tell you, I've been incredibly lucky to work at three departments where people have actually valued an insanely crazy entrepreneur who had an opinion that like what they were teaching was wrong. And not only did they throw me out, they embraced it. That's a big idea. Stanford, Berkeley, and Columbia all said, oh yeah, you think you're right? Go teach the effing class. Let's see what happens. Pretty amazing. Not only didn't the antibodies reject it, they said, okay, let's, you know, we're not going to shut down our departments tomorrow just because you think this is the right way to do it, but let's go try it. And so one is, I, you know, I've been lucky to be at three great schools. Two is um, certainly at Stanford and a little less so at Berkeley and Columbia, but still leading, they've adopted, you know, MOOCs, you know, massively open online classes. Stanford is probably one of the leading schools just pouring them out now from first going no way. And then like the light bulb went on and said, sure, what the heck? Why don't we see if this is a interesting modality? So I think the, the at least the schools I'm dealing with are trying to uh, be pretty modern about the 21st century. And we're going to find different schools, uh, you know, adapting and adopting at different paces. You know, there's still schools teaching students how to write business plans. And on the other hand, I now teach a class for educators every quarter that's gone from, you know, like 20 people showing up to now we turn them, turn educators away and we sell out at 100 educators a quarter learning how to teach what I teach. I think that's pretty amazing. Um, and we're going to do the same for incubators and accelerators this fall. So I, I, I guess I'm a little more hopeful. Um, I think, at least for entrepreneurship, I think you raise a more general question about, you know, implicitly about the price of higher education versus, you know, its value and can that be sustainable? And the answer is, well, of course, for the top 20 schools, it's sustainable because it's not just about the education and it's about the networking and the rest. There's a bigger issue about the bottom thousand schools and whether that's sustainable. Very interesting question, but a bit beyond my pay grade. <laughs> Well, I have one more quick question for you, and this will be the last one so that we can get you off the phone here. What are your thoughts around software patents and whether or not they're effective and done the right way? And the reason I ask is because there is a lot of patent trolling going on, especially in the world of podcasting. It's really an interesting thing to see how this is actually going to pan out. Yeah, so patent trolls fall under the class of something called economic rent, and patent (laughs) trolls are rent seekers, meaning right. there's a class of uh, individuals and companies that don't create value but actually charge rent on top of other people's value. And so what they have found is essentially a loophole in a good system, the patent system, and figured out how to uh, suck value out of all these people. Now, I'll give you another example. is uh, Banks trying to stop PayPal, auto dealers trying to stop Tesla, hotels trying to stop Airbnb, taxi cabs trying to stop Uber, what you typically find is the people who are objecting or trying to make money out of that are not the direct competitor. That is, the people who are objecting to Airbnb aren't Airbnb direct competitors. They're the people, they're the old industry. People objecting to Tesla are not other electric car companies. They're actually an old industry distribution channel. Hmm. People making money off of patents are not competitive patents. They're people who've gamed the system. And it turns out that in countries uh, where, pat- where rent seekers win, innovation dies. That either and what rent seekers could win through corruption or gaming the system or bribery, etc. Um, and rent seeking is in fact the antithesis of innovation. And what's really interesting is politicians tend to talk out of both sides of their mouth. Oh, we love innovation and equals jobs. Well, okay, so why don't you kill trolls or why don't you kill you know X or Y? Oh, they happen to be our major contributors. Or <laughs> they, you know, so, so I just want to give you a, a, a view is that, of course, patent trolls, I mean, they should be embarrassed to tell their children what they do. And in fact, if you really want to uh, solve this problem, people who have been attacked by patent trolls should start picketing their kids' schools and their homes and, and letting their families know that they're equivalent to pornographers. Uh, and then we'd actually uh, uh, maybe see a major change if we, we could, in fact, not make it an honorable profession. But until we start doing that and think that we're going to 
solve the problem by suing each other. They have a lot more money than you do. Uh, yeah. But they've gamed the system to make it unproductive. That's amazing. And as predicted, this was another great interview. Steve, really appreciate it. And like we talked about, the four steps to the epiphany, just rewritten, coming back out, and the startup manual. Where else can our listeners go to, you know, I know you do a lot of writing and things. Where can they go find you? So I have a blog called steveblank.com. Um, it has every possible way you could screw up a startup. Um, if you want to read about some of my war stories, it's about some of the observations um, I make about uh, entrepreneurship in a regular blog. And if you look at the tabs at the top, there's a section called Startup Tools, which are tools for entrepreneurs, and then Slides and Video, which are all my uh, educational material, all the, uh, my classes, my syllabus, an educator's guide. You can see presentations all my students have done. And so everything I do is open source, and there might be something in there that your listeners could find valuable. Yeah, absolutely. I actually went to your site earlier today, and you do just give it all away. So appreciate that. And we'll be sure to put a link to your site as well up on smartpeoplepodcast.com. So Steve, thank you so much for being generous with your time. This was great. We will go ahead and shoot you the link to the show when it goes live in about a week. Great. Looking forward to it. Thank you for your time. Guys. Absolutely. Thanks, Steve. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Another successful show in the can. I really can't believe that we're now in triple digits. I didn't think we'd get past 100, and we've made it one past. I didn't think we'd get past one. Yeah, well, you know, look what happened. Thank God we went up on new and noteworthy. So the Startup Owner's Manual, great book. The Four Steps to Epiphany. The t these two books will give you that strength, kind of, you know, that resolve to move forward with your startup and your idea. Talking to Steve, obviously, it's just good to have somebody that knows what they're doing, been there, done that kind of give you advice along the way. So cool the kind of people we got to talk to. Don't forget to check out bespokepost.com slash smart and sign up for a monthly box of cool stuff for guys. You know, after Chris and I opened the box, I, I thought to myself, how much could this stuff actually be worth? And I went on the internet, searched for all the items in it, and it came out to be about 65 bucks. So you're getting a great deal at $45 a month. You can stop at any time. You can defer boxes if you want. So if you want to skip a month, you can do that. Yeah, I mean, you actually found the exact, all of the items exactly and put it together and it was over 60 bucks. Yeah, so, so every single thing. So not only is it a money. deal, it's cool stuff. Yeah, and if you want to save even more money, make sure you use our link, bespokepost.com slash smart and save 20% off your first box. And make sure to connect with us on Twitter, Smart People Pod. We love people reaching out. Reach out to our guest and say, hey, just heard you on Smart People Podcast. So great. We, You know, that kind of community, everybody's responding to that. It's so much fun for John and I. Thanks for being part. Thanks for joining us. Every week, you know where to go. Smart People.